Yeah, I know. I know. Based on that answer, I know it's cold. The three greats and the one half-hearted woo. I know. It's tough. I had to go to ORU this afternoon, and walking up the hill to the aerobic center, I almost didn't make it. I just almost said, well, this is where it ends for Jonathan. Right here on the hill. So cold. So cold. But listen, we're going to get right into it tonight. Uh, this is the last... Uh, of this series that we've been talking about this month called Tough Love, and we've been looking at the book of Mark, and you know, I, I really thought that we were going to be able to cover a significant portion of the book of Mark uh, in a month with, with eight different services to cover it, and I think I got through chapter two of 16. I maybe snuck into three for a couple verses, but not, not many, uh, and, and so, we, we, you know, we just barely barely scratched the surface of, of a lot of really good stuff. And, it, and it's been good, but, but we haven't been able to do it. But today I'm going to give you a little, we're going to cover it in speed and not getting all the details, not getting all the meat of everything, but, but something that I want to make sure we get a picture because it highlights this picture of, of, of the message. Uh, and the title of tonight's message is Don't Miss the Meaning. Uh, and, and because so many times in life, uh, both in the natural and the supernatural, we can have events happen, we can have things, we can read things, we can experience things, and they can be good things, they can be bad things, they can be difficult things, but in the end, we walk around and, and we miss the meaning of what it is we just experienced. We miss the significance of what we just experienced. And so uh, I, I wanted to kind of walk through a couple of things and just, I'm gonna give you a couple highlights of some sections of scripture to, so that we can know the context of where we're gonna end up being. So in Mark chapter four, uh, starting around verse 35, 35 through 41, that's gonna be the story where Jesus comes to the storm. You guys know it. He gets in the boat. He says, go to the other side. He falls asleep. Storm comes. He rebukes the storm. He calms the storm, Right? Then right after that, he goes and he heals. In chapter 5, he heals the man possessed with a legion of demons, right? And he, he casts those demons out. He heals that guy, and it's awesome. Uh, and, and then in, in chapter 5, verse 21 through 43, it's the kind of the twofer story where he ends up going to heal that man's daughter, Jairus' daughter. And in the process, the woman with the issue of blood touches him, and he heals her. And then he ends up going and raising Jairus from the dead. Like, he has that whole story. That's in, in chapter 5. Uh, and then chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, he goes back to Nazareth, and Jesus is re kind of rejected in his hometown. They, they, they know him too well. They grew up with him, and they said, isn't this Jesus? You know, sometimes you get rejected the most where you grew up. Sometimes it's the people who know the most about you who, who can't get over what God's done in you the most. And, you know, for Jesus, in his hometown, it says that was the place where he wasn't able to do any great signs or miracles because they didn't have faith. Because they would say, well, isn't this Joseph's son? Like, I saw him. I saw him do stuff. I saw him as a little kid running around. And so we, we have that. Uh, chapter 6, verse 7 through 13, the disciples are sent out. He sends them out in pairs and he gives them instructions. And they go out and they spread the word. They teach a message. And it says that they heal people and they cast out demons and, and different things in this time. So they actually begin to do ministry uh, going out to different places. He gave them really in, in some instructions. Uh, then the, the rest of chapter, or the middle of chapter 6, 14 through 29, it talks about the death of John the Baptist, which it's, it's an interesting story, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. And then in Mark chapter 6, 30 through 44, it's the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And this is one of two instances in Mark that it talks about Jesus feeding a large group of people. And he does it in a similar way. It's a little different, but in a very, very similar scenario. And, you know, Jesus is out. He's preaching. All these people have followed him. In fact, multiple times we talked on Sunday the crowd was many times a deterrent for Jesus. And this is no, exam, no, no, no exception to that role. He's actually been trying to get away from them now. And now he can't seem to get away from them. If he gets in a boat to try to go somewhere else, they somehow beat him there. If he goes into the wilderness, they follow him. Even if they have no food, no rations, no profit, they just keep following him everywhere he goes. They keep meeting him. He can't get away from the crowds. And he begins to teach these people. And he's moved to compassion. 
and he, he's teaching, and after he's been there for a while, the disciples come to him and say, hey, we need to send these people away so they can go find food and stuff because it's, we're, we're pretty far out and we need this. And Jesus says, hey, I want you to feed them. And, you know, the disciples, despite all this, despite just those couple of chapters of miracles and things that they've been part of, miracles they've seen, you know, they're still, they're still just not understanding. And they're just like, Jesus, how, how are we supposed to do this? How can we feed this many people? We would have to work for, for years to be able to do this. Which, I mean, in the natural, it's true. I mean, yeah, it's not like it's a crazy thought. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. We'd have to work forever. And so Jesus says, well, what do you have? And they come back to him with an answer. It's a, little an, a literal answer. They say, we have five loaves and two fishes. You know, I don't know if that was the right answer, because I think the, the right answer, if they'd been paying attention, what they had in front of them was the bread of life. He was there. When he said, what do you have? The word was there. The creator of life was there. The one who could do the impossible was there. But they came back with a literal thing. Five loaves, two fishes. You see, clearly Jesus is not enough. There's 5,000 men there's also women here. There's also children here. So there's tons of people. And this is all we got. You ask for proof. Well, here's proof positive, Jesus. What you're asking us to do is impossible because this is all we have. And it says that Jesus took it. He broke it. He gave it to them and told it to hand it out. And that bread began to multiply in the hands of the disciples. And it says that the bread and the fish, they passed it out until everyone was fed and there was surplus. There was leftover. And this is this amazing thing. This is an incredible miracle. He goes and, and he provides something out of basically nothing. Or he multiplies the little we have. And there's so many good things that we can have that just a little bit in the hands of Jesus, he can make it more than enough. In fact, he can make it overflowing to where there's a surplus. And, there, and, and those are all true. But there's something else here, and, and we'll see it in a, in a minute. So he feeds the, the 5,000. And then right afterwards, after he feeds them, he basically tells everyone to go home. And he gets his disciples on the boat. And he sends them across. He tells them to go on. And he goes to a remote place to pray. And this is in, in chapter 6. This is around verse 45. And then in, in verse 47, I want to read this for you. And it's interesting. I want to make sure we read it. It says, late that night, this is verse 47. The disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land. And just so you guys know the, the, the typography and the geography of where we're at, this lake is there, and there's a lot of cliffs and hills along. So it was more than likely that Jesus was at an elevated place where he could see them. And it says, he saw they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water, he intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all afraid when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I'm here. Then he climbed in the boat, and the wind stopped, and they were totally amazed. For they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. And this is interesting. Because verse 52, the last one I just read is the interesting one. It said, for they still didn't understand the significance. And before I read this, I thought I knew what it was going to say. They still didn't understand the significance of the last time they were in the boat and Jesus calmed the storm. Because that makes sense. They were in a boat. There was a storm. Before they were in a boat, there was a storm. Jesus calmed the storm. Jesus got in this boat. He calmed the storm. Oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense. But that's not what it says. They didn't understand the significance of the loaves. What, 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 are those, what does that have to do with anything? You're confused. That, that, those two things aren't, aren't together. That was a miracle of provision. Before we had Jesus doing a miracle in nature, and he did it again. Maybe they didn't understand that. Maybe they messed up. But you know, I was reading and studying and, 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 and praying about this. 
surprise, surprise, the Bible means exactly what it says. And they didn't understand the significance of the loaves. Because there were things that that was supposed to teach them that they missed. And they missed the point of the miracle. They thought that this was something that Jesus could provide for physical needs for them and for people. But he was trying to show them something. He'd already done this once, but he was trying to show them something. That God has the power to deliver us no matter what the natural limitations are. That he has the ability to do it. That the bread multiplied in their hands as they were giving it, that they too had the power to do it. That Jesus had already saved them once and Jesus had already told them again to go on the other side and that he believed that they had the same authority given them. He's already sent them out. They've already prayed for people. They've already healed people in Jesus' name. They've already cast out demons in Jesus' name. They've already seen Jesus speak and calm the storm. They already had their Savior tell them to go to the other side. And yet, They were there in trouble. And you know, it's interesting. It says in the scripture that Jesus, when he was walking on the water, originally was not walking to them. It says he was going to walk by them. Because he believed they should already know that they have the authority and the ability to calm the storm. That they already have the relationship. That they already have been given something that gives them the ability to get through something they've already been through. And he wasn't even going to go. But they saw him. And the funny thing is, they didn't even know it was Jesus. At first, they thought it was a ghost. And they were petrified. And it wasn't until he spoke, as like, guys, calm down, it's me. Jesus, remember your savior, that they then said, please, come help us. Side note, lakes in Israel must just be dangerous. <laughs> like, when you get in a lake in Israel, I mean, it just, it just seems crazy with some of the stories in the Bible. I mean, our lakes aren't like this. I mean, even when it's bad, you don't see this, like, people, like, not able to row across the lake. Like, for, and these aren't, like, it's not like I'm out there. I don't know what I'm doing on a boat. These are, like, fishermen. And they can't get across the lake. I mean, yeah, they, they don't even need to go to the ocean or the Sea of Galilee. They can't handle it. They can't get across a lake. So they're like, they're done. But they missed the significance that when Jesus did this miracle, he was trying to show them, do you not understand who I am? And he, he actually says that when he was speaking to him. And if you don't... If you miss it, in verse 50, it says, They were all terrified when they saw him, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. He said, Take courage. I am here. That's how the New Living Translation said it. Some translations do it better, but if you actually go to the Greek, what he says is he says, Take courage. Don't be afraid. I am is here, which is how God introduced himself to Moses in the burning bush. He said, I am is here. The one you missed in the loaves and fishes is here. When I said, who's here, instead of answering, I am is here, you came to me with, you said, five loaves and two breads. The reality is, the Son of God is here. And right now, the person who's here is not Jesus, some man. It's I am, the God, the creator of the universe, is here in front of you. When he said it, he said something that was very powerful. He said, I am is here. And Peter, in his reflections, said they missed it. They missed the meaning of what the loaves meant because if they would have truly understood the miracle of the loaves, they would have realized that I am was already there and that he had given them the power to do the impossible. And things are accomplished simply on the word that was given and spoken. They missed it. And I love Jesus that 
even when they missed him. And even when he thought they should know better. When they called out for him, he still came and saved them. He still came and comforted them. Even when it says their hearts were too hard to take it in. He still comforted them. And you know, there's, it's interesting, there's, there's two miracles that this represents. You have to understand what they, this is all very similar. This is all this closure. Them crossing the sea and the bread, these represent the two miracles that the Israelites held very dear to them, which was when they crossed the Red Sea and the Jordan on dry ground and when God provided manna in the wilderness. And yet here Jesus is two times calming the storm so they can cross the sea, just like the Red Sea, just like the Jordan, and then providing bread where there was no bread, providing a way when there was no way, providing something out of nothing. And you would think at this point, okay, got it, got it. We understand now, Jesus, we're totally in. So you continue on. That's the end of Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 7 goes, and he talks about inner purity. He begins to say, like, he has this argument with the Pharisees, and he says, you know, listen, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. Basically saying that all things are clean and pure to eat, that you don't need to fight about it. Like, that he's saying that, that you are speaking things out of your heart and that you pervert God's word to try to keep your own rituals. And he said, you need to be more worried about what's in your heart than what you're putting in your mouth. You need to be more worried about the relationship you have with your heavenly father than the traditions and the rituals that you created here on earth. And then in verse 24, he has that very interesting conversation with the Gentile woman who comes asking for Jesus to heal her daughter who was possessed by a demon. And he says that I shouldn't feed the dogs when the kids are here. But she says, can I just have the table scraps? And he says she has great faith, and then she, he says, your daughter's healed, and she goes home, she's healed. And then 31 through 37, Jesus heals the deaf man. This is when Jesus starts his spitting ministry. <laughs> you know, getting spitting and putting stuff, and like, you don't know, it just came out of nowhere. He's like, you're going to change it up. And then Mark 8, 1 through 10, Jesus feeds the 4,000 this time. He had 4,000 men, women. Children, very similar scenario. Jesus felt bad for him. He knew if he sent them out there, they would faint. So same kind of deal. They found some bread. They found some fishes, prayed for it, multiplied. Very similar, very similar. And then after that, he goes to another town in verse 11. And as soon as he gets there, the Pharisees meet him and basically say, hey, if you're going to talk to us, if you're going to try to teach us, we need you to perform a miracle right now so we know that you have authority. Jesus was like, I'm not doing that for you. You're not getting a sign. God's not some magician that you just get to call up. God's not somebody who needs proof. And so he just turns around and leaves. And it's interesting. It says he got back in the boat to go to the other side. And in verse 14... It's so funny. It says, but the disciples, remember everything that's happened. Remember now we've crossed two incrossable dangerous lakes. We've multiplied food twice. We've cast out demons. We've healed people. We've seen blind eyes open. We've seen deaf ears healed. We've seen people raised to life. We've seen demons fleeing. We've seen all sorts of stuff. It says, but the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. How many people were in the boat? Thirteen. Common core math. No, I'm just kidding. Thirteen. Twelve disciples plus Jesus. One loaf. Well, now we know that five loaves can easily be multiplied for 5,000, right? We got one loaf. Twelve guys plus Jesus. And it says, as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, watch out, beware of the yeast 
of the Pharisees here. And I can almost picture this. Jesus is frustrated because he just went somewhere and the Herodians and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and they're giving all this stuff and he's so sick of the fact that, the, that these people are so, they think they're so holy, but they're not. They think that they're pure, but they're not. That's why he starts calling them whitewashed tombs. If you want to know like a modern version, he basically says that they're full of crap. They're pretty on the outside, but full of death on the inside. Like, he calls them terrible things. He says, you brood of vipers. He calls them son of Satan. Like, he does not like these people. They annoy him, and he's so frustrated. And I can see him, they get on the boat. He's like, we're going to the other side. Get in the boat. Push it. And don't even think about a storm stopping us. Because if you guys fail this one again, I promise you will regret it. So he gets in the boat, and he's in there, and I can just see him. His hair is just waving in the wind. And he's like, be wet. He like, has a real serious thing. Like, he's like, I'm going to teach these guys a real serious moment. This is time for them to learn something today. And he's like, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. He's like trying to get them this thing. He's being poetic, and he's really giving this great example. Yeast always represents sin. That's why the, the, the communion loafers and the, and the ceremonial loafers have no yeast in them because yeast represents sin. And so he's like, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Herodians. And he's over there, and the whole time he's trying to talk, and he and this is Jesus, he's doing that. And the stupid disciples are in the boat, like, well, you were supposed to boast bread. You were supposed to bring the bread. Why didn't you bring the bread? Bartholomew, you have one job. No one mentions you ever. It's because you're the bread guy, and here you are, no bread. We got one loaf of bread. We're full-grown men. What are we supposed to do? We're going to starve on this. We have to go all the way to the side. You know how long the lakes take to cross sometimes. We could get stuck rolling for hours. And if I don't have bread, what are we going to do? We're here in the middle of it. And Jesus is trying to teach them. And they're like, oh, you were supposed to Thaddeus, every time we give you one job, blow it. And all of a sudden it says, Jesus knew what they were saying. So he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Your hearts are too hard to take it in. You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all when I fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread? How many baskets did you have afterwards? 12. We had 12. And when I fed 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven. Don't you understand yet? Don't you understand yet? I've said it to you with my mouth. I've shown it to you with my actions. I've done miraculous signs. I've done everything I can. It doesn't matter what learning style you are. You can be tactile. You can be auditory. Maybe you're just an experiential learner. You've gone through all of it, and you're still here ruining my message. We don't even know what he was about to say. He was in the middle of something really good. And it got cut short because they're arguing about peanut butter and jelly supplies. To the one who very recently showed that nothing is impossible for God. That lack of food is not a problem for God. That lack of provision is not a problem for God. That adversity is not a problem for God. And then you go past this in verse 22, and Jesus heals the blind man. There's more saliva involved. And then 27, maybe, maybe for the first time, Jesus says, who do people say I am? And they say, oh, something like this, something like this, something like this, right? But then he says, who do you say I am? And for the first glimpse of hope, Peter says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus is like, Finally, it's taken you eight chapters to figure it out. But now you get it. And we're like, good job, Peter. You did it. Then verse 31 comes and he says, now I'm going to tell you, and this is in secrets. I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to tell you about how I'm going to die, but then I'm, I'm going to raise to life. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about that. 
And afterwards, in the middle of it, actually, Peter pulls him to the side because he's feeling confident now because he got the answer right. He pulls him to the side and says, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I know you can do miracles and stuff. You make the bread happen and all that kind of stuff, but that's, what you're talking about is crazy. You can't do it. Don't do it. It's not good. It's not good. We're really getting some momentum here. The ministry's really growing. and things are happening. You're doing really good stuff. Your, your miracle power with my, uh, my prowess of social media, we can really do something big here. So, so you can't kill you. You can't die because that's the end, you see. So don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You can't do it. And then that's when Jesus basically gets everyone else around and then he tells everyone that uh, he tells Peter to get behind him, Satan. So he calls him Satan. Which is pretty harsh. He literally says, get thee behind me, Satan. So he had it for about one verse. For one verse, Peter understood what was going on. And then the very next verse, he blew it. And Jesus is back to square one. None of them get it. None of them understand. And I won't, we don't even have time. If you keep going... I just can't imagine, I, I, I can't imagine Jesus, the, the fact, that all I need to know that Jesus is the son of God is the fact that he didn't smite any of these people that were following him. Because he kept going and he would keep saying things and it just keeps saying, and they didn't understand. He'd be like, I'm going to die and in three days I'm coming back. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? What do you mean you're going to die? Like, I'm going to die. I will die. And then in three days, I'll come back. Is this a parable? <laughs> no. This is literally happening. This is, I'm literally going to happen. And I don't get it. I don't understand. He got on the Mount of Transfiguration. He literally became white as snow, more white. Moses and Elijah showed up. Peter didn't know. He just started talking like, oh, hey, 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 let's build some tents. Let's do some stuff. Hey, build a tent. Build an altar. Build a tent. Altar. Tent. Who's going on? What's going on? Who do we tell about this? This is great. This is great. This is great. He's like, what are you doing, Peter? Just stop talking. Didn't I tell you to get behind me? Why are you here? Still didn't know. Predicts his death again. I don't know. And then the craziest part is he dies and all of them are like, oh, I didn't see this coming. <sighs> I had no clue. This is taking me totally by surprise. Did you know he was going to die? He's dead. It's over. And there's no recording in any of the four gospels that any of them said, do you remember when he said he was going to die, but he said something like he was coming back in three days? Does anyone else remember that? No, one's, no one remembered. No one remembered. And that's proof that Jesus was the son of God, the fact that he just didn't start over. Like at some point, you're like, time out. You 12 are out. I'm going to get a new 12. Maybe they can understand better. But all of this, in, in it, like, it just goes on. Man, if you, I, I hope you're reading it. Man, I read like 10 or 11 chapters just straight today, and it gets comical. It gets comical when you read it really in close succession, but you're just like, oh, my gosh, this is painful. Jesus has so much patience. But, you know, the thing that these have in common is that after both miracles, after both feeding the people, after, after everything, they missed the point. And moving forward, they still missed the point. And it literally wasn't until Jesus died and rose again and talked to him again for like the hundredth time that, that they kind of understood. And then it literally took the Holy Spirit coming and filling them and changing them for them to really grasp it. But it made me start to think, you know, as much as it's fun to laugh at them and to think, how, 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 how can you miss all of this? It makes me think, how many times have I missed it? How many times has God done something for me, provided for me in a way I didn't think was possible, and I missed the actual message because all I saw was the provision? I didn't actually see the facts. I, I saw the provision, whether it be financial or grocery, like whatever. I saw the provision just like they saw the bread, but I didn't see I am was the one providing. And so therefore, when the provision was gone, I was right back to where I was before I had the provision because they had leftovers for a while. And then at some point, they were back to one loaf. 
And at some point they forgot and they got the provider and the provision confused. And they missed it. How many times has God done that and missed it? How many times have I faced a situation that was difficult and I think that Jesus is walking by me and he's leaving me in a difficult situation and I get upset about that and I miss it and really I should understand, yeah, he's walking by because he's like, you should already have this in control. You call for me, I'll come. You don't actually need me because in this world you will, you will have trials and tribulations but take heart because I've overcome the world. And these things that I'm doing and greater and greater you will accomplish here on this earth. So how many times do I go into a trial and I'm in the wind and waves and I miss it? How many times am I in a trial and I want Jesus to come and fix it the same way he fixed it before? Remember Jesus when we were in the boat and the wind was going really cold and you said, peace be still, and then everyone was still? Well, I'm in a boat again, and it's really crazy again, so I'd love for you to get in here and say, peace be still again, please. When Jesus is saying, don't you remember the bread? The bread? I'm in a boat. Bread floats, but that doesn't help me. No, 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 don't you remember the bread? Don't you remember the one who was there? Don't you remember the power? Don't you remember when you just kept multiplying and the bread kept multiplying in your hands? Don't you remember when you kept seeing a miracle and you were literally part of a miracle? Don't you remember? Don't you remember that I may not do things the same way every single time? Don't you remember? I don't always have to be in this storm with you. I'm always with you. I'm never leaving you. But you can tell the storm to be still. Don't you remember when I sent you out? And you were able to cast out those demons. And you were able to open those blind eyes. And you were able to preach in my name. Don't you remember? And how many times do I miss it? And have I forgotten? Or I just want him to do it the same way he did it before. Remember that time, God, that you saved me from this similar situation? And he's like, but don't you know what we've walked through since? Don't you know what we've done since? Don't you remember what I've called you to now? You know, we talked about this last Sunday, the things that God's calling you to and that the doors that he's calling you to, that Jesus is the door, but sometimes those doors don't look like what we think. That they can look like disappointment, that they can look like opposition, that they can look like obedience, that they can result in revelation, that those things can happen. But sometimes as opposed to walking through the door that God set in front of us, we just want him to bring the door that we remember walking through before. Because it's comfortable. But Jesus doesn't call you to comfort, he calls you to calling. And the moment you latch onto your comfort more than your calling or what he's calling you to, you'll never step out and do the things that he's calling you to do. Of course it's more comfortable to have Jesus in the boat with you. That's easy because you know that he can do it. But sometimes he sends you out in the boat. He sends you somewhere and he says, go and do it. And don't worry if a storm pops up because you have me with you always. And we miss it. We miss it. And, you know, for me, when I, when I sit here and I, I read this, as much as I'd love to think that I'd have done better than Peter or James or John, because don't even get me started when Jesus is literally in Jerusalem, and they're like, hey, Jesus, whenever you ascend into your glorious throne, can I be on your right hand? And they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest, and he has, like, to pull the caravan over like a mom pulls over the van and starts slapping kids in the back. Like, what did you, what are you doing back there? No, nothing. He knew. They were talking about who's the greatest. They're literally arguing on the road. And Jesus says, what are you talking about? They're like, nothing. Nothing, Dad. And he's like, are you arguing over who's the greatest again? The least of you will be the greatest. And right now, that's hard to figure out. It's a 12-way tie for who's the worst. And one of you is going to betray me. So put that in that whole character study. I'd love to think that I'd be better. I'd love to think I'd be smarter. 
I'd love to think that I would have been this like super, superstar. If John was the beloved, then I would have been like the super beloved. But that's not true. Because all these stories in the Old Testament and New Testament are just a picture of man and the fact that we are flawed and the fact that we miss it. We miss right in front of our face. And it's easy for us to see other people and say, how, how could you miss that? Yet we miss things that are just as easy. I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on a lesson and working on something that I literally started working on, maybe before this, but actively started working on it when I was 13 years old. And it doesn't sound hard. But it's the concept of thinking before you speak. That doesn't seem like it'd be that difficult. But I have 15 plus years of failure to tell you it is. Because sometimes what comes out of my mouth is not an accurate reflection of what's in my heart. So somewhere between my heart and my mouth, things get a little distorted. And if I don't stop, and if I don't remember what it is, if I don't say, Jesus, I need you in this, I need to invite you into this, because I'm just like them missing the point. That I need your deliverance and I need your help and I need your grace and I need your mercy in this and something that's, that's so, so interesting. You know, I hear it all the time and I understand the Christians who just say, oh man, I want to grow and I want to grow mature. I'm in my spiritual maturity. And the, listen, something I'm learning is, you know what? I don't know if I need to learn anything new. I maybe just need to practice the things I already know. Because I just keep failing at all that. Like, I can't get, like I said, I at 13, I remember that I read Proverbs and this thing that kept talking about the wisdom and discernment and when knowing when to speak. And why, and I, I was 13, I said, I'm going to do this. And I'm 33 and I still can't do it. If I could just do the things that God's already shown me, my life would probably be a lot better. But that's easier said than done. If the disciples would have just done what Jesus told them to do or believed the things that Jesus said or walked in the miracle power that he had already given them, then we wouldn't have any of these stories where we're like, oh, idiots. But that's not as easy as it is. I still have to invite Jesus into my speech. I still have to invite Jesus into my, and I won't stop. I can't stop. Or else I'll miss it. I can't think because he helps me in one area that now every other area is going to be completely free of adversity. Because the enemy hates you and he goes around like a lion seeking who he can devour. And he will put things in your path. And the minute that you start to conquer one thing, he will try to stir something else in you. Because he doesn't want you to see, succeed. He doesn't want you to know you're loved. He doesn't want you to know that you have a calling. He doesn't want you to know that you can be free from the things that are holding you back. So he wants to keep you captured in the things that have always captured you. And if for one minute you think that you don't need to invite Jesus into the process and you don't need to see the I am and your situation, whether it's financial lack or a relationship or in your speech or in your anger or in how you treat your wife or in what you do with your kids or in how much you trust God or whatever it is, it doesn't matter what your area is. If you don't see that the reality is and he says what's in front of you, if you start trying to name objects of what you can do to fix it, you're missing it because I am is in front of you. And he wants to help you. He really doesn't need you to bring anything to the table. He just needs you to come to him. And sometimes we miss it. I know I do. I know I do. I know I need to daily, if not hourly, and by Jesus to help me. He'll work it, and he'll do it. And the most comforting thing is even if I blow it, and even if I'm in the boat rowing like crazy, 
And even if everything should be okay and I should be able to take care of it myself, even in those moments when I can't, I only have to cry out to the Savior. He'll come. He'll come. And he'll calm the storm and he'll fix the thing. And he'll say, hey, you know what? We can do better next time. But I'm still here for you because I love you. My grace covers these shortcomings. He's not asking for perfection. But he wants you to see the miracle that's in the loaves. He wants you to see it. He wants you to see that I am is walking around. He's there. And he can help you. And for me, and in the studying and all, and in all this tough love and all this stuff, the thing I walk out of February with is that Jesus loves me so much he won't leave me where I'm at. He won't leave me where I'm at. He loved me too much to let me stay in the place that I'm at. Even if I say, but look, God, look how much better I am than five years ago, than 10 years ago. Look how much better, look how much better my life is. Look how much less sin I have. Look at it. And he says, listen, I don't care about any of that. I don't care where you've been. I care about where you're going. And I love you too much to stay where you're at. And so then all of a sudden I find myself falling right back into his grace, right back into his mercy, right back into his forgiveness, right back into the things that I need with a complete new renewal of the fact that he loves me too much to leave me where I'm at. He loves me too much to live with character flaws or shortcomings or wrong beliefs or wrong thinking or wrong feelings. He loves me too much to keep me here. And he shows enough tough love to confront me even on the most minimal things. Because where he is, truth and grace always are found. And he wants to bring that in me. And so I leave February and I walk into March understanding that Jesus isn't done with me yet. He's not done walking up. And just like Philippians said, that he that began the good work in me will see it through to the end. And it makes me realize I'm not going to arrive. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I arrive. Just because I've worked at the church for 10 years doesn't mean I arrive. Just because I get to preach to us, well, you want to, if anything, no, it doesn't change anything. I need him desperately for the shortcomings in my life. And I need to search for him so I don't miss him. I don't miss the miracle and the bread. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for what you're doing in our church and these people who are here brave in the cold, Father God. Lord, I just pray that every person here, Father, as we leave this place and we go and, and celebrate your love and your goodness, we would reflect on the things that you've been showing us this month, to the fact that you are not not okay with us staying where you're at, that you're willing to have the tough conversations, the tough love, the confrontation, to move us to where you're calling us, to, to, to remove dysfunction that creates separation from you, Father God. Lord, I thank you that at the end of this, we can see that we don't miss these miracles. We don't miss the significance. We don't miss who you are. We don't miss the fact that you're there. You're here with us, that we can continually fall in your mercy, continually fall in your grace. We can continually invite you into our shortcomings and our process, that we never arrive because you're always calling us deeper. You're always calling us higher. You're always calling us to new things and new challenges. And in that, Father God, it's just a new place and a new opportunity to be covered again in your goodness and your grace and to have the waves of your mercy wash over us, Father God, again and again and again. Let us never grow tired of trusting and relying on you in every area of our life, Father God, and to see that you're calling us to bigger things. And if we just look in the natural, we'll miss him. But you've called us to have supernatural vision. We thank you for that. Bless every person that's here. Keep them safe. Keep them warm. Keep them dry. Let them enjoy the rest of this week. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen and amen. Hey, listen, church family, we love you. This weekend's going to be great, like Pastor Andrew said. You guys should be there. It's going to be awesome. Be safe, be safe, be safe. Be warm. Throw an extra log on the fire. You guys are dismissed. Have a good night.